We've talked about the different brain areas that analyze the different aspects of any stimulus. So for example, the parts of your visual cortex that analyze color are stimulated by this stimulus. Uh, also the ones that involve the analysis of shape. Okay. If I have the ball move, then the parts of your visual cortex that analyze movement are also stimulated. Maybe this thing makes some sound as it moves. Now we've got auditory cortex activated. Here's a question. You've got activation in color processing areas, form processing areas, depth processing areas, movement processing areas. Those are different parts of the brain. How does your brain know that the activity in those four or five different areas refers to the same thing, to the same stimulus? How does my brain know that pink, round, moving, and this depth plane all refer to this and not, I can't find anything pink or round, but not something else. Maybe this is stationary and my uh, T is moving right next to it. How does the brain know what parts, what activity in different brain areas needs to be grouped together? That's a big question. Another question is what holds them together? The question of how do you integrate across different brain areas, we call that binding, binding, right? The process by which different features are integrated into the perception of a coherent whole. Now, Ann Treisman, who you know from previous lectures, uh, was a tremendous role model for me, um, had a classic theory of how binding occurs, and it relates to attention. Here was her thought. Initially, you see an object, say this pink ball, all right? The light from this ball falls on the back of your eye, and you have... Um, ganglion cells there that do a little bit of simple uh, shape and color analysis and then it's passed up to the visual cortex and you know we've talked about Hubel and Wiesel's model maybe edges are pulled out all of that stuff happens without attention so she thought of uh, visual processing as including a pre-attentive stage that is processes that occur before attention is needed and uh, for the stimuli that I'm showing here, for example, on the one on the left, pre-attentive processing would include determining that that thing is small and that it is a diamond and that it is blue. So it's taking all the features and identifying their existence individually. All right. But then she had a focused attention stage. And in Anne's model, the idea was that what attention does is it integrates the information across the different features. So my ability to see the shape on the bottom right as a large yellow oval requires attention. But according to Anne's model, seeing it as yellow or large or having a particular shape, those independent features did not. So the combination of the features is um, what attention does in her model. So to go a little more specifically, the pre-attentive stage in Anne's model happens automatically. You don't have to pay attention. It doesn't require any effort. Right? You're not aware of it happening. I'm not aware of it happening. And whatever we see is analyzed into these little feature bits. But the subsequent stage is what combines the features into objects. Now, how did she test this? Well, Anne developed these visual search tasks that have been classics in the field of attention and cognitive psychology for decades. And we're going to play with these. So what Anne would do is create two visual search situations. One of them, in one of them, you just had to look for a feature. So to find a green T in the display that's on your bottom left, all you have to do is look for green. And in fact, the green thing jumps right off the screen. So she called these feature searches when detecting the target only required you to focus on one feature. And as you'll see in a minute, what she found is that when you only have to, when the target is different from the distractors or all the non-targets by a single feature, 
uh, that target just jumps right out. In fact, she called it pop out. And um, pop out doesn't require attention. So that's all consistent with this pre-attentive processing stage in Treesman's model. She also created a set of visual search displays that in her model would require attention because in order to find the target in these displays, you have to combine features together. So to find a green T in the uh, image on the right-hand side of this slide, it's not enough to look for green because she also has green T's that are tilted horizontally. So they're kind of not a T. They're, um, uh, so it's, it's tricky, right? She might say in the, in the figure on the bottom right, look for the tilted green T. It's not enough to look for tilted things. It's not enough to look for the letter T. It's not enough to look for the green things. You have to combine tilted and green to identify the target. And what, and I'm jumping ahead here, but what she found in what she, she called these conjunctive searches, because you have to conjoin features, is that it takes people a very long time to find a target in these sorts of displays. And as she increased the number of distractors or things that you had to look through as you were trying to find the target, in conjunctive searches, reaction times get slower and slower and slower. This is a summary of what I just said. On the vertical axis is reaction time. How much time does it take you to detect the presence of the stimulus that you're looking for, detect the target, or find Waldo, if you will. And along the horizontal axis is the number of distractors. How many other things are there in the display that are not the target? And what I want you to see is the feature search, which is the display on the bottom. When the target differs from everything else in the display by one feature, it doesn't matter how big the display is, people are really quick at detecting it. Okay, it pops out. The conjunctive search, however, as you can see on that graph that the line isn't flat, the conjunctive search line is tilted. And what does that mean? It means that as the number of non-targets or stuff you have to go through to find the target you want, as the, if you will, the environment in which uh, Waldo is hiding gets more and more complex, it takes more and more time to find the target. If I ask you to look at the display in the right-hand side of this slide and say, find the red circle, you do it immediately. That is a feature search. It pops, the red circle pops out. You don't need any attention. You're fast at detecting it no matter how many other things are in the display. I could fill that whole, a whole wall in my office with green dots. <clears throat> and if I just put one red dot on there and ask you to find the red dot, you'll do it immediately. All right, so that's pop out. Now, if I ask you to look at this display and find the green dot, uh, I'm sorry, was it green? Nope, and find the red dot, it's gonna take you a lot longer. It's going to take you a lot longer because there's a lot of different stuff there to, for you to look through. So conjunctive searches take longer because you have to combine features and that combination of features um, requires attention. Okay, so best way to teach this stuff is for us to do it ourselves. So enjoy this part. You don't have to write anything down. Um, I'm gonna show you a bunch of displays and I want you to yell out or use your inner voice if you're in a if you're at work or someplace you can't yell out. But in this next display I'm going to show you, I want you to tell me as quickly as you can, does the next display contain a vertical green T? Ready? Vertical green T. Here it comes. Do you find it? Yeah, you found it right away. Super simple. Crazy simple. That's a feature search. Doesn't require attention. The thing just jumps right out at you. Okay, let's do another display. Does this display contain a tilted or sleeping green tea? Ready? Here it comes. Did you find it? Yeah, you found it. But it took a little while longer. And why did it take longer? Because you couldn't just look for green things and you couldn't just look for tilted letters. You had to put the two together. And according to Anne, that requires attention to be deployed to each little thing. You have to look at each little figure in the display and that takes attention. Okay, here's another one. 
Ready? Tell me if this next display contains a vertical uh, black line segment. Okay, a black vertical bar. You ready? Black vertical bar, that's your target, go. Took a little longer, didn't it? Yeah, right. Because you can't just look for vertical things. You can't just look for black things. You have to combine the two. Um, and you have to look for, you have to combine the straight and vertical um, to find it in this task. So this text took time. So you tell me, was this a feature search or a conjunctive search? What was that? That was a conjunctive search, took time. Okay, yell out when you see a vertical red bar. Easy, so what is this search? It's a feature search because the feature, the individual feature that makes it different from everything else in the display pops right out. Pre-attentive processing, doesn't need attention. Okay, how about a vertical red bar in this display? You got it? Okay. Conjunctive search, conjunctive search, because you have to combine vertical and red to identify the target. That requires attention, so you have to deploy your attention in all sorts, all over the display. We're going to, actually, no, I'm not gonna do it. You, as my students, are going to do a, um, a set size effect in their um, activities for this lab. But this slide summarizes what we've talked about thus far, which is two types of search. Pre-attentive one, doesn't require attention, pop out really fast. And a attention demanding task that um, requires a combination of features and it, how long it takes depends on how many other things or distractors there are in the scene. Okay, come back and we'll talk about hemi neglect and I'll show you an amazing video.